you guys are doing. Hey, this morning we got a really awesome, I think special morning because not only are we doing a watch party, we're doing a watch party with the Hill Church, right? So the Hill Church, there's some folks from the Hill Church here this morning. There's some folks from Belmont that are here this morning. And we are coming together and doing basically a combined service because Pastor Charles from the Hill Church, one of our partner churches right here in Roanoke, is going to be sharing the message today. And the Hill Church in Belmont will be watching it at the same time right now on Sunday morning. And so uh, we are honored to be able to partner together in this way. You are in for a treat. Pastor Charles over the last couple of years and his wife, Trené, have just been a huge blessing to me and my family, but also to the Belmont family as a whole. And so uh, we're going to continue in, in our Be the Church sermon series. And so I want to introduce Pastor Charles right now. He's going to come up and open up the Word of God for us from Acts chapter 5. So let's give Pastor Charles a round of applause, guys. How about it? All right, so uh, I figured we'd start with just a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for everything that's transpired so far this morning. And now, Lord, as we transition and we pick up in uh, Acts in chapter 5, we pray uh, that the church today could read this, analyze it, and digest it with fresh eyes. Um, even if it's words we've read a thousand times, I pray that we can approach it as if this is the very first time we've read it. And that as we get up from this moment, as we uh, close out today, that we are inspired to be the church. And so, Lord, can you please have your way? I do not want to speak from my opinion. I don't want to speak from um, just my own personal thoughts, but I, I want to articulate your words. And I want to clearly highlight what your spirit is saying, has said, and is pushing us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So as we were picking up in chapter 5, following John as he did chapter 4 last week uh, in the book of Acts, verse 1 and 5 picks up the story of Ananias and Sapphira, and it reads, uh, But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. However, he kept back part of the proceeds, and with his wife's knowledge, and brought a portion of it and laid it at the feet of the apostles. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? Wasn't it yours while you possessed it? And after it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? Why is it that you have planned this thing in your heart? You have not lied to people, but to God. And when he heard these words, Ananias dropped dead and a great fear came on all who heard. The young men got up, wrapped his body, carried him out, and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And tell me, Peter asked, did you sell the land for this price? Yes, she said, for that price. Then Peter said to her, why did you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. And instantly she dropped dead at his feet. And when the young men came in, they found her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Then great fear came on the whole church and on all who heard these things. This passage, as we're, I guess, analyzing it with our 2020 um, view, Seems very harsh. It seems like the Lord was not playing. There wasn't an awful lot of grace here for those people um, that, you know, they it doesn't even seem like they did a real bad thing coming in and lying about their property. But there is something here that is pretty clear that the Lord is saying to the church then. And I think he's saying it to us today as believers on one being truthful. Right. And not lying like it. Like I think we've kind of um, watered down, you know, telling the truth or, or white lies and all those things. But then there's something else happening here in this passage. And as we've been progressing through the book of Acts, 
um, especially at Belmont. We kind of went through a sermon series of this last summer, but we see that there is just this amazing thing happening through the church, that the Lord is having all these signs and wonders. People are being healed and delivered and freed from prison. I mean, it's just one thing after another. And then in chapter four, it's concluding with this beautiful picture of the church where you have people who care about each other to where they're selling their personal items. They are involved in each other's life and they are sac they are making these amazing, tremendous sacrifices to make sure their brothers and sisters are taken care of. This is an awesome display of the church, how the church could be. And I know there's a lot of people who, you know, I hear it all the time. We need to get back to the Acts church. We need to get back to the Acts church. And, and you see all these signs and wonders, but this is a sign and wonder. And I don't think anyone wants to get back to dropping dead for lying to people. Now, we may want to get back to the other things, but I don't, no one's ever said, man, I want to get back to the part where we die for lying. Um, but that's obviously what happens here. And the Lord is saying something to the church. And Luke, who's writing this letter, this beautiful letter, is communicating something as he's going through and he's trying to display something because this happens right after we have this very small section in, at the end of chapter four. If you look up at the end of chapter four, it says in verse 32 that they, they, the entire group of these people believed they were with one heart and mind. There's this tremendous unity that's being displayed here. Great power uh, with the apostles. We're giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. I mean, things, it's like the old Visa commercial where everyone's coming in and doing their transactions. Everything's going great. I mean, it's just this great, um, wonderful time where it's just people are blessed and they're preaching the gospel. And I love how in verse 36, it says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus by birth, the one the apostles called Barnabas sold a field he owned, brought the money and laid it at the apostles feet. And if we miss that part, we're missing what Luke is saying as he's paralleling this this in this contrast with this next part where it's this dark transaction that's about to take place. But he's kind of given a picture of even why that happened. And it's basically Barnabas who kind of kicks off this thing because he is the picture, I guess, or the image uh, of it's kind of like it's a general statement that the church is doing all these great things, but then it gets to Barnabas as an individual and it says, Barnabas sold a piece of property, gave the whole thing and laid it at the feet of the disciples. This is a beautiful picture, but it's also telling of Barnabas, right? Barnabas's name, and it shows us here in verse 36, his real name was Joseph. It wasn't Barnabas. Uh, Barnabas is who we know him by. No one says, remember Joseph, you know, the guy in the book of Acts or the guy who went around with Paul. It's we all know him as Barnabas. Barnabas would have been his nickname that was given to him. Uh, son of encouragement is what he would have been known as. And if you watch him as you guys are continuing through the book of Acts, you'll see that is really what he does. He is just an encourager. And that's where he gets this nickname. One of the cool things we see, like this isn't the first time people are given nicknames. Like during the Gospels, you see Jesus giving Peter, uh, well, Cephas, um, which his real name um, was Simon, but he's given the name Peter, which is a nickname that Jesus gives him, which is a little hilarious it, because at the time he's given this nickname, he, the translation of that is rock. Peter definitely at the time where Jesus calls him Peter was not a rock. He was more like a pebble uh, who was flaky. And it's like Jesus gives him this nickname. And then Jesus goes and he gives John and James the sons of thunder. Like these are, these are the closest guys to him. And he gives them all nicknames. It's kind of like, you know, my nickname is Boom. Uh, the reason why I had that nickname growing up is because my parents and my, all my family members would say when I was a kid and, and they would hold me, I was so active. I would jump out of your hands and hit the floor. Now, I don't know who the person who allowed that to happen, that I got the nickname, they shouldn't have been holding me in the first place, but my whole life, that's where I got that nickname. There's this guy we used to play basketball with in the park, we called him Grasshopper. I, I shared this before, we thought he was homeless, but it was just kind of the way he shot the ball that looked weird, like a grasshopper, and we just called him Grasshopper. And many of you out there have nicknames or you grew up with someone you called Stubby or, or Lefty or whatever, and it's based on something that gave them you know, that thing because, because of relationship. That's your nickname, Stubby. That's awesome. Um, and, and, and this is kind of the picture here where you see actually the disciples kind of continuing that thing that you see through the Gospels of, of just this family and kind of having an endearing word or a name to give to someone. And that's kind of cool seeing that 
with Barnabas. But one of the things with all of his great attributes that I really love comes out of Acts 11. Look at that real quick because this ministers to me in my heart when I think about this dude, Barnabas. Chapter 11, verse 22. News about them reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and large numbers of people were added to the Lord. I love how Luke basically hashtags, gives Barnabas this beautiful statement. He was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Like, I don't know about you, but I want to finish this race mm -hmm. and I want that to be said about me. Like, like if there's something they're going to put on my tombstone, I hope I live a life that honors the Lord in a way that that could be said about me. He he was a good man, full of grace, full of the Holy Spirit. He spoke truth. He loved the Lord. He completed this race in a way that inspired other people. And this is the picture of Barnabas. Like Barnabas is a faithful person. And now as we're getting into chapter five, we see this is just transact, this transpired, right? The church is seeing this. People are excited. Things are going great, but it's like that Visa commercial, right? Now someone comes with cash and messes up the whole thing. And this is the picture that's happening here where the Lord is making a statement to the church where these people come, they sell their property. They are engaging with one another. I mean, these are the closest. This is a husband and wife and they say, you know what, honey, we see all of the props that Barnabas gets because he was faithful, because he was just this great dude. He comes in, he gives everything, and everyone's like, yo, this dude is amazing. We're going to do the same thing, except we're going to keep back a piece. And we're going to tell them that we gave everything. And that's what happened. They conspired together. They came to the church to put on this thing, this show, and to look like they were more faithful than they actually were. And this is kind of the world we live in today and it's with, with the um, photo ops and, and our selfies. It's this, this image we're displaying that isn't really accurate of who we really are. And if, I, if there was the, something I wanted to say as my first point, it would be that. It would be dialing down a little bit on that, that, that we don't do a good job of identifying where we really are. Like we, you know... I, I constantly think about improving and getting better when I make mistakes, but I do not take a lot of time analyzing my true location. And, and that's something that no one has ever taught me. No one has ever said, hey, where are you currently at? Like I'm always striving to be something different. And this is the problem we see with them, that they, they, there was no indicator for them in their life for them to identify where they really were. Like they, they, their hearts were jacked up. Like they were in a bad place, but they thought that their performance, that, that their performance before people was actually the same as what the Lord was seeing. One of the things that we can make sure we're teaching our kids as we're discipling other people is helping them understand the value and who we are before God. We've, we've seen and we've watched fake lives and people who present and project something, but man, there's, there's far more value and really being truthful and being truthful with yourself. I think Warren Hill says, you know, every day people lie to God. Like what makes you think they won't lie to themselves? And I think we've bought into this thing where we lie to ourselves and we don't value really knowing where we are. Uh, we have a 0809 um, Lincoln MKX and we've had it for about four or five years. And we've been able to drive that thing from the Grand Canyon to New York uh, multiple times, back and forth from Dallas to New Jersey to the Grand Canyon. And last summer, uh, we were at the store one day and steam just starts coming up out of the engine. And I'm looking for an indicator to let me know what's going on. I open the hood, there's steam everywhere, um, but there's nothing in the dashboard to tell me that the car was overheating. Like, I don't even know why you would make a car in 2009 that doesn't have that indicator. And I could have blown the engine up in the car because it never told me it was overheating. And that is kind of this picture of live, driving through life and going through life with this false sense of security where we don't really give the Lord or other people time to actually help us see who we really are. 
Like, where are our indicators? Like, everything on the dashboard in the car is there to give us an indication of something that we can't see easily. The speed, it tells us you're going 55 miles an hour. Without that, you wouldn't know it. This is how much gas you have. This is, you know, how much oil you have. Like, all those things are in the car to give us indications on where we really are. And we need to, as a people, make sure that we're not running on fumes, that we're not just thinking we're somewhere. I mean, this works in our marriages, this works in our relationships, but this definitely works in our spiritual life, that we should not continue to lie to ourselves and think we're somewhere or we're something that we are not, that we should always ask the Lord, search me, O Lord, like scan my heart, scan, Lord, is there something I'm missing? Is there something I'm missing as a father, as a husband, as a neighbor? That, man, if there's something in this new world we're about to engage in is that. that we can't go in unequipped to really look at ourselves as people. And I think there's something hidden in there that if we truly take time to look at ourselves and allow the Lord to see us, to show us who we are, I think we will probably have far more grace for other people. I think we would see other people in their mistakes, where they're not tolerant, and we'll go, you know what, if, if it wasn't for the Lord, or if I haven't grown in this area, I probably would be doing the same thing. And that's, I don't know about you, but for me, I want to do that better. I, I want to know, I don't want to lie to myself and think that I'm far more mature, or I'm better, and I can't be taught this, or I don't need to grow here, or that I've mastered this area. When the Lord's looking at me going, boy, you ain't got it together at all. You are missing this mark. The second thing Um, in this passage is we need to be connected with real people. And when I say real people, we need to be connected with people who can tell us the truth. And we give permission to tell us the truth. Look at this passage. It says in verse nine, why is it that you have agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Which means they thought this through together and neither one of them had the courage to say, this is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Think about that. They they were together. They were coming to the church. They've watched the Lord do all these great things. And they figured it's worth compromising in this area to be seen as something that we're not. When this is a great, um, so think, I don't even want to get ahead of myself, but think about the alternative, right? What should have been the question is, why is giving all of it a struggle? Why are we struggling with this? Well, why, why doesn't this come as natural as it, as it is for Barnabas? How is he, what has happened in his life where he's willing to give it all? And why are we willing to hold back and lie? What is wrong with us? That, that was the message there, but instead they conspired together. When I first moved to Dallas, and things weren't going great, and I was serving at this church. Uh, I remember one day the church was going to pay me to cut the grass, and I was so focused because I needed the money, and so I started cutting the grass. And the pastor called a couple people, a couple men from the church to come help me. I didn't know this, but he called them, and I was so focused. I'm on the riding lawnmower, and I'm trying to get it done, and I didn't even stop to say hi, to engage with them, and I'm the youth pastor there, and one of my jobs is to meet with them and to talk to the families, but I'm so focused on getting this job done that I didn't take time to go talk to them, and the pastor challenged me, and he pushed me a little bit, and he said, you weren't focused. You just really didn't care, and I was like, well, that's not a nice thing to say, like, but it was the truth is that I didn't consider them important enough for me to get off the riding lawnmower because I wanted to get this job done. And I needed him. I needed someone who loved me enough and wanted me to develop into a good pastor to kind of poke me in my chest and say, bro, you, you, you are so interested in getting this grass cut. That grass is going to grow back next week. But these people here, it would have been nice for you to get off and show them that they were important. And what the pastor taught me that day was that, man, I can make excuses and I can tell myself that I got to get this done because I have something else to do. But I need real people who could care less about me being super happy with them and saying things that make me feel good. And someone who's going to push back on me a little bit and say, you are wrong. And Ananias and Sapphira, I mean, who else would have been the right and appropriate person to do that? 
who else than that person that you are married and engaged with? Like the God has sent you a partner or God has sent you a family member or God has sent you another believer to be a person in your life. And do we give them the authority or the permission to do that? I know for me, man, I definitely wouldn't be all of the man that I am without my wife who definitely does not let me get away with murder. Like she, she is not going to let me, um, if I said, Hey babe, let's cut this corner or let's do this. She's like, boy, are you crazy? Like she is definitely going to call me out and push on me. And I need that. Um, and we need that. And we need to make sure that we give people that permission and say, Hey, if you see something in my life that is not consistent, and is out of step. And I say that all the time, something being out of step. So, so when I, and I think I need to explain that. When I say out of step, I mean like a marching band, right? Or like a Janet Jackson dance routine where there's like 60 people dancing, right? And then there's just, imagine one dude who just starts doing the robot and while everyone else is doing the same step. Like he, he looks weird. It doesn't go along with what everyone else is choreographed. And that's what I mean when I say out of step. Like this is the direction we should be going. This is how things should be flowing. And if there's one weirdo doing something that is wrong, they, they will easily be seen and we all need to go hey we're not pop like rock locking right now we are doing this we don't want to be out of step with who the Lord has called us to be and for the hill church last week I was preaching through Joshua and we we kind of analyzed a little bit of this sense of being out of step where Joshua is confronted by the commander of the Lord's army and the statement that, he, that is made to him there, when Joshua asked, are you for us, are you for them? The statement, the response back to him was like, nah, or neither. And what he's saying here is like, you, have, you think that's an option and you think that's an option. And you actually think because you know the Lord that you're always in step with what the Lord wants. But it is definitely possible to be a Christian and still be out of step with the Lord. And that is what, kind of the picture of what I'm saying here is that we need people to definitely have the ability to call us back, to, to, to point on us and, and, and definitely say, hey, man, hey, girl, that ain't right. If, if I want to give you a little challenge or, or something, um, an application with that, I would definitely say, uh, ask your, you know, make up something stupid and ask your friend, hey, man, I was thinking about doing this and see what they say. If your friend goes, yeah, you should punch him in the face. You, you've, you've cultivated a relationship that is not healthy. But I definitely encourage somebody, especially younger people, if you're 16, 15, 13 or whatever, and you have friends and you just think of a bad idea. You know what I was thinking? I was just gonna like do this and see what they say. If they don't call you back to the Lord, if they are not a voice of reason, then you need to be careful of the people you are letting speak into your life. And that doesn't just go for 13 year olds, that goes for 33 and 67 year olds that if you see something that is out of step in society, if you see something out of step with the board that you're on, if you see something out of step with the corporation you run, you, you need to make sure you have people around you that speak into you so that you can be courageous, but that you can also be faithful to the Lord. And spouses, that I mean, that is who better? Parents, who better? Neighbors, pastors. Nathan, looking at his friend, David, He's out of step. He he's slept with his friend's wife. She's pregnant. He's going on with his life. He has his friend killed. He he is far from the Lord. And Nathan challenges him and pushes on him. And David turns from there as he repents and he is brought back to the Lord. And this is when he writes Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Sometimes, you know, we read that and we're encouraged, but that was initiated by a brave friend who knew it could cost him his life to confront the king. And David writes something that we today cherish because he had someone close to him that cared more about what the Lord thought and less than what the king who was out of step with the Lord thought. And the last thing that I have here um, is that we, as a, as a Christian, like we, like we 
are to live lives that are full of sacrifices. Like, we are not called to self-preserve, our, but to preserve ourselves, to, to continuously protect ourselves from truth and, and challenges. I remember when I first got saved, and I remember the pastor always asking, it's offering time, or it's time to give a tithe. And, and I remember, as, especially as a young Christian, and being so like, all right, I have a few dollars in my pocket, I'm going to give this $5. I remember when giving $5 was a big deal, and I remember when giving $20 was a big deal, and, and $30. And I remember at the end of the year, one year, we gave like, and I thought, man, we must have gave about a million dollars to this church, and it was like $300. <laughs> And I'm like, that is definitely not a large percentage of our income. But I felt, because it was just baby steps for me, I thought I was doing something big. And that's because I think because of my training in the culture and in the world that I felt like, if, like in, in order for me to survive or for me to make it, I need to keep more of my resources. And I didn't understand sac- what sacrifice really looked like. And, I, and if there's anything as a church planner that I've learned is I'm watching people who, who give and don't give and are struggling with it, that this is a big issue today, that we are not as sacrificial as we should be, that we really should be giving it all. Mm-hmm. Now, I know the old generation, man, they got that. Um, last week, we received a, a card from um, a lady who was a friend of my grandmother's. And so my dad's about 65. I would imagine she's like 70, 80 years old. And she I mean, we're six hours away. She knew me. She knew my dad when he was a baby. And she saw our one year anniversary and she sent us a card with like a hundred dollars in it. And it's, it blessed me tremendously because I know this woman is a widow. I know she doesn't have a lot of resources. I know she doesn't have a lot of money, but she, for some reason she understood or she understands giving and and promoting the gospel and supporting the gospel in a way that I know that at times I can even struggle with. There's another older lady that I that I know, Miss Miss Petway, who she sent us I think $25 last year, and it's the same story. She doesn't have a lot of resources. She's passed away now, but it was important to her to give something to this young uh, ministry pastor um, that she understood giving in a way that she knew it cost her something, but it was but it was like a blessing to her to give of what she had. And this is kind of the picture where Jesus in Luke 21, where he pulls the disciples and he's like, look, look at this widow uh, in verse one. It's like, and he looked and he saw the rich putting their gifts in the treasury. And he saw the poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. Like, like, what did she, how did she, like, they gave big money. Like, how is it that she gave more? How is it that it's because what she gave wasn't just her believing in her faith and where it was going. Like she, like she, like her survival was threatened by what she gave. That that what Jesus saw in her faithfulness was a woman who said, this is far more important to me than even keeping these two mites. Like these two mites, please, like this is a privilege and a blessing to give. And if there's Something that Barnabas knew was that, man, this is to contribute, to give is far more important than to hoard up or to keep. For you, for me, um, this is definitely an area of prayer. You know, there's a story that I've heard of a, a young preacher when he was in seminary and he said one time he was in Baltimore and he was in the car with his friends and as they were riding down the street they saw this group of guys beating up this guy and and um, you know the streets of Baltimore can be tough and and he's like stop the car and his friend is like no um, like are you crazy like those guys if you get out there they're gonna get you And he's like I can't sit here and watch that and he said he yelled stop the car and the guy stopped the car and he ran down to the guys as they're beating on the guy and he's like stop what are you doing and he's yelling at these thugs and then the guy stopped and he and it was just pretty amazing that the guy stopped He put himself out there. He could have been beat up. He could have been killed. But he tells the story that as when he did that that day, he knew he was led by the Lord. He knew what he was doing um, could cost him something, but it was far more important. And then he said, years have gone by and he's married and he has kids. And he says, now when I think about that moment, I am I feel myself being slower to get out of the car. 
there is something with this journey where we, we start losing sight of what the most important thing is. Having someone in your life and people around you to help remind you is so important. Having the word of God and reading through it and letting it read you and speak to you and, and show you and give you those indications of this is where you really are. You, you, you've actually gone backwards here. You, you're not a sacrifice. You, you're, not, you, you're not sacrificing in ways. You know that fasting is a sacrifice. It's, it's saying, um, I'm going to turn down my food. You know, giving is a sacrifice. You, you know, praying is actually a sacrifice. It's you saying, you know what, I'm going to take this time. I'm not going to invest and spend my energy on trying to manipulate my way through. I'm going to go speak to the Father. And this is the type of people or the kind of people that God has called us to be. Sacrificial people. And if there's anyone who's given the greatest sacrifice, it is our Lord and Savior. I can remember after he's baptized and he's drawn out into the wilderness and, and Satan is trying to offer him things and he's like, no. He's given the opportunity to have this and go here and he's like, no. And for, for us, a little at a time, I think the world is trying to lure us in and lure us away from the Lord. And we definitely need to be careful and cautious that we don't compromise in ways that looks like our friends here in this passage. Yes, your time, your talent, your gift, but also your money, right? We, like, we, we can't get around that and ignore that. I know in a culture where the church isn't trusted when it comes to finances, that we still need to push on people to be faithful financially. Yeah. Like it's, it's definitely a stronghold for many people today. If Jesus has given it all, how, how can we stutter on that one? And I know for you and for me. And so what do we need? We definitely need indicators to help us. That if you, if you take out your checkbook and it's time to give and you start feeling threatened, that is a you need to write down, I feel a little anxiety when it comes to giving. Why, why am I not faithful in this area of my life? But if we don't have people around us, who are pushing us on that. We'll ignore it. We'll, we'll make excuses. Well, I give to, you know, this organization over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about the area where God has told you to be faithful? Like, we, we definitely need to be exposed. Like, like, we hide from being exposed, but it's good, and it's healthy, and it is rich. It is far better to be exposed than to continuously be a fraud. James 4 says, you unfaithful people, friendship with the world is enmity with God. I want to I do better. I don't want to drift into um, compromising areas in my life. And we want to be a church, right? We want to be a church that is faithful to Jesus. That if Jesus asks us for everything, we go, yes, sir. And I think he's asking more often than we're listening. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the example you set before us. That you saw and you were offered many things. But you pressed to give everything. You stood before kings who thought they had authority. And, and, and from your perspective, you could see an expiration date on their kingdom. That their kingdom would end and yours was everlasting. Father, help us. Help us properly weigh what's before us. That we only have a short amount of time to be used for your glory. And let us not compromise. Father, we want to grow to be faithful like great men, like, like Barnabas, who was an amazing teacher and leader and who was selfish and who encouraged the brothers and sisters around him. And Lord, we don't want to drift like we saw this couple. 
So could you please help us with our relationships, with the people around us? Can you expose us in the areas where we protect ourselves and we keep people away from us that want to help us? Help us desire truth. Help us want to be exposed. And Lord, as you do it, as you clean us up and make us better, we know you will be glorified and you will look at us the same way you looked at that widow who gave her little two mites with great pride of knowing that though this giving of our time and resources uh, seems to be threatening our, our physical things, it is definitely enriching our spiritual lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, I hope this has been an encouragement to you. Um, we are just excited to be able to even do this with you um, in Belmont and the Hill Church together. This is definitely our family. And so we hope this week as you go out into this world that you use this as an example, that you seek healthy friendships and relationships, that you start being attracted to being exposed and not trying to hide yourself. Um, I know for me, I need that. I need to definitely place more indicators in my life to tell me you are running on E, you are drifting off course. Um, I, I know I need that. And so as the Lord brings those things, let's receive them. Amen. Amen. All right. Peace. Pastor Charles here with my brother, Pastor John, Laughing House. And we wanted to speak to just some of the concern and pain that's out there in our culture, um, in the country, and even in our context here. Yeah, especially, uh, right now, especially in Minneapolis uh, with George Floyd, uh, and also with Ahmaud Arbery, and just really hundreds of names that could go out there in regards to just the pain that specifically, I think, the black community is feeling right now. And so, because we're both pastors of multi-ethnic churches, because we love God's people, and because we're all both made in God's image, and we love each other, Right. Um, just felt compelled um, to, to share a brief word just about how our hearts are feeling uh, and just um, just speak to the situation. And so for us here at Belmont, for me as your pastor, I, I really right now the words that I would share would be um, just awareness and empathy for my white brothers and sisters in Christ just to say that even though um, this is a situation that for many of us, we have the comfort and the ability to be able to um, just ignore that we shouldn't because these are our brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible tells us that we have been brought together in Christ, that we're made in the image of God. And it breaks our hearts when anybody of any race and any culture um, is shown injustice and especially loses their life over that injustice. And so let me encourage you as a white person to say that enough is enough, that you would become aware, that you would do the work that it takes to, to put yourselves in the shoes of any minority culture and say that being mistreated because of the color of your skin or because of your background or because even of your economic status is not right. It's sinful. And so we as a people and we as a nation um, should not allow that and we should always be striving for justice. And so that's kind of how I'm feeling is a little bit of angst and anger and um, just wanting to continue to learn uh, and, and do my part to cause some awareness, especially among those that look like me. And, you know, we, we shouldn't have to as a society this isn't right we shouldn't go through this the trauma african americans are, are facing is is horrible to consider you know that this could happen to you or someone that you know uh, i think one of the things that i wanted to communicate especially to my young african american brothers and sisters who are struggling and are angry and are filled with fear and they want to do something i i, I just feel compelled to just offer a sense of hope um, you know, the fact that we are angry, the fact that we are upset, the fact that this hits the news is because it is wrong. 
Like we live in a society that, uh, in a country that has said that we should be free, we should be treated fairly, we should not be judged based on the color of our skin, and that this made the news because it is wrong. If we live in a society where everyone, and, and, and trust me, I read the comments of people who are still saying stupid things like, well, what did he do? And maybe he did something to deserve it. That is not the truth. And that is not how we should be processing things. That That isn't the majority of people. And so we can't be overwhelmed by that because there are some people out there saying bad things. That the truth is we do and we still live in a place that says that that shouldn't happen. Now we know that um, our country doesn't always live up to the things that she says is true and is right, but we still have hope that we still live in a place that says that this is outrageous, it should not have happened, and we are demanding justice. And the fact that we're angry and appalled is because somewhere along in your life, You've been taught, uh, whether it's from your family or your school or uh, like me, I was in the Cub Scouts. I was taught that the country I live in does not, so, shouldn't support that and that we have laws and things to correct it. Now, we know that this country has many sins that it needs to repent of and we are lamenting this together, but we will not quit. We will not give up. We are still marching towards justice. We are still fighting that people will be treated fairly. We are still moving in a direction where we will we will not give up and we're doing all of that on the shoulders of people who had less advantages than us that we we are getting glimpses of things being better that that my parents generation and my grandparents generation did not see the advantages that we have and so we have reasons to have hope and to keep striving towards what Christ has called us to be that we are ministers of reconciliation and so don't give up I know it's painful, I know it's hard, but don't give in to the darkness, that there is enough light that, that persists through Christ Jesus for us to continue to move forward, no matter if it looks like this is the worst time ever. We have hope. That's a good deal. Thank okay. you. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us um, even when we don't deserve it. And God, we just pray right now for justice in our country, Lord. We pray for uh, just for your love to just pour through this country, God. And we just pray that there would just be an awareness and, and a desire to see all men and women treated equally because they're made in your image. And Father, as we fight together the good fight, I pray that we do not get weary. I pray, Father, for this generation who... Um, is witnessing things um, at, a, at a, a rate that seems to be overwhelming. Lord, we are being conditioned to think that this is how it should be. Yes, this is how it is, but this is not how it should be. And so, Lord, I pray for strength for this generation. I pray, Father, for a boldness and courage mm -hmm. for pastors and leaders and even those who are growing up and Lord, I pray that you will take the scales off of the eyes of people who think that this is right and mm -hmm. cannot see the pain and the injustice that is happening at a grotesque rate. Lord, um, we will not give up and we will not give out because you are with us. And Lord, be our strength until justice runs down. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, God bless you guys. Be encouraged. Hey, don't take off yet. Do me a favor, jump in that chat right now and go ahead and shout out the Hill Church. I'm going to give you just a couple minutes here. Uh, just drop a thank you. If you're not familiar with the Hill Church, they are located here in Roanoke. They're a new church, our sister church, and we just want to make them feel special. So do me a favor in the public chat, say thank you, Hill Church. If there was something specific about the message that you really, really love, drop that in the chat. Let them know. Uh, I know they would be encouraged by your comments in the chat right now. Uh, as a way of ending, I want to remind us, especially if this is your first time joining us online, that we are a church who is about helping you to believe in Jesus Christ. We want you to belong to a church community, a family of believers. And ultimately, we really want you to become the best version of you that you can be uh, under the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So our, our online host is gonna drop 
a salvation moment right now. If that message that Pastor Charles just spoke really hit you, if it's really speaking to your heart, even right now, as those comments are coming in the public chat, do me a favor, click on that salvation button. We've got folks standing by even right now who are ready to pray for you. If you need prayer, don't let this time go by. We have hosts who can pray for you. There is a prayer button that you can click. That is for you. This time is for you. Uh, this online ministry, it's for you. Don't let this time go by. A couple of other quick announcements uh, before we close out. One, don't forget about our lobby. We have a virtual lobby happening right after this. Uh, our host is going to drop that link into the chat uh, so you can hop right on after we pray. We, you can hop off of online church and right into our Zoom lobby, especially if you're new here. Hey, we want to get to know you, uh, and that's a great way for you to just see some people face-to-face, -face, connect with some, a couple of folks. Uh, we'd love to see you. Also, if you join late, don't forget that this is the last Sunday for our Be The Church Love Offering. And so if you have not had an opportunity to give, or maybe the comments that Pastor Charles spoke about in his message are really resonating with you right now, and you feel like, hey, I'm at that place where I realize now that I need to give more of myself, I need to give more of my finances or more of my time, the place to do that is, is on our Be The Church offering. There's also a link that's going to be dropped where you can text to give. Uh, lastly, don't forget to fill out that connection card. Uh, maybe you want to talk to us about something that's, that's going on in your life. Maybe you've been impacted by recent events or the coronavirus. We as the church need to know about that. We want to know about that. Uh, we're here for you. So don't leave. Fill out the connection card. Uh, we want to hear from you. Lastly, I just want to say thank you uh, on behalf of Pastor John, the elders, our deacons, our leadership team. Hey, we love you guys, and we love doing ministry. We love doing church with you. We love being the church. So thank you so much. Uh, we hope and pray that you have a wonderful and blessed week. Join us in the lobby. I'm going to pray us out, and then you can go enjoy your Sunday afternoon. So Father God, we just thank you so much for Pastor Charles, the Hill Church, uh, for Jason and Ann doing their two-minute testimony. Lord, I just pray for anyone right now who may be hurt or lost or uh, who was challenged by the message that you would continue to stir whatever that is going into their heart right now, that you would stir up their spirit or that you would provide them with that, that healing that they may need, that peace that they need, uh, that peace that transcends, transcends all understanding. Father God, we love you so much, and we're going to give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor that you so rightly deserve. We love you. We need you. We trust you. Hey, do me a favor. In the public chat, type amen, amen, and amen. Thank you, guys. Love you. See you next week.